thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. This is a different talk for me. As Siva said, well, it's not really actually, uh, because uh, let me tell you my own background. I was born on the north side of Dublin when I was 19. I went, I wanted to play in bands, so I went to New York with just a guitar to my ticket, and amazingly it happened for me. Like, I played in a band that were kind of well known in the underground scene there for a few years. And when that finished, I became, I went to, to uh, the School of Visual Arts and I studied graphic design. And when that finished, I went to work with Wall Street. Now, that was a big change for me because up until that point, I'd never had an office job. I'd never had a job where I dealt with corporations. Like, the only jobs I had as a teenager and stuff, I worked, you know, I worked in bars and, you know, I washed dishes and that kind of thing. So I was in a different kind of world and not being connected to like music and something like that. I was also very creative. I used to put paint and draw, write poetry, and write short stories and political satire and things like that. And so what happened was when I was entering into this world, it was almost like a shift in my own consciousness because first, I was, the first time in my life I was actually had to be aware of being responsible for bigger projects and so on. And I think because I came from a different background, I thought there were a lot of people in there who were, were like workers' tents who were involved in like Broadway and things like that. I was able to observe the business world from outside. And through a series of circumstances, one day an individual came up to me and told me he was, he was, a, he was a, a diagnosed functioning psychopath. And I thought at the time a psychopath was, you know, like a Jason from Friday the 13th, an axe murder, you know, that kind of a thing. But it turns out that that wasn't his story at all, and that wasn't what a psychopath was. A psychopath was a, from what, you know, he'd, he would have, this guy had basically been a rich kid from a very wealthy family. He had robbed an uncle, a friend of his father's car, driven to Boston, spent a lot of money, and because he was rich, he got away with it in America. They sent him to some kind of psychiatric testing, and he scored this thing called, the very top of this thing called the psychopathy scale which means that he basically had no remorse, didn't care about anything. He, he, he would just see people as targets. He had no deep feelings for other people. And he was also very glib, superficial, and always trying to impress people. And he was using and manipulating people. Now, at the time, for some reason, that seemed very interesting to me because I couldn't understand. I was also going through a sort of a, a crisis in my own life because I couldn't understand I, I, why there was so much suffering in the world. When I was eight years old, I was nearly killed by a Lyla's car bomb in Dublin, where that blown up around the corner from me and killed 33 people. And when I was eight years old, I was kind of stepped into, this, into a consciousness that came out of nowhere. I became aware I existed. And from that point, I used to be very, I was kind of very deep and very withdrawn, and I couldn't watch the news. I still can't. And I could never understand human suffering, why the world was a mess the way it was, why economic problems existed, why people, you know, were so cruel to each other in relationships and things like that. And when he told me this about the psychopath, and I looked, and I looked up at what it was, at the time there was no internet, uh, it, it, it opened up a world for me, and then suddenly I became very interested in him. But that's what this talk is necessarily about tonight, but I want to explain to how I came to this point. So, it's, as I found out more about this subject, and I read books by Robert Hare and Marcus Stout, and sort of journal, journals from like Harvard Medical School, as a lay person, a picture started to develop and I started to understand this was what was wrong with the world. Now, again, I'm not, I don't get too caught in the subject tonight, but we can later on if you want to talk about it. But essentially, I realised that the problem with this planet was a dysfunctionality that was purposely built in by pathological individuals in positions of power. They were actually creating a mess in this world, economically, politically, socially, using and then turning us against each other by causing conflict through things like, you know, gender, issues, you know, turning men against women, you know, uh, racial, sexual identity politics, things that were people were told to put these badges and labels above their humanity, because that's what a psychopath would do. They would not see themselves as a person, they would see themselves as a banker, you know, they would see themselves as the label, because ultimately they have no personality inside. So then, you know, being the kind of geeky person I am, I started to want to know what made them that way and what the hell they got in the positions of power. And so it became a weird, so my initial thing was, we're dealing with some kind of brain damage. You know, there's something, there's something wrong with your brains. And you know, you're talking about someone who was basically, you know, I was that close to an atheist that I hadn't taken like things like mushrooms and LSD, I probably would be, you know, I probably would be an atheist. But I, I always tried to keep myself kind of grounded grounded on these subjects. So I went immediately into the, the material side of things. 
and I looked at is it, is, it, is it damage to the brain? And I found that it wasn't necessarily damage to the brain, but their brains did work very, very differently. Now this is all getting somewhere. Now the brain of a psychopath, if you put a brain of a normal person and a psychopath under a magnetic resonance imaging machine, an fMRI, and you show them certain external, external stimuli that evoke an emotional response, say a mother holding a child, there's a certain electrical responses in the partitions of the brain that relate to things like emotions. You might get another one where you show a particularly violent image of someone, may, maybe someone killing another human being. Now, this is what they do to them. Um, a normal person, other partitions would light up like fireworks, right? But the psychopath would stay in neutral the whole time. There was absolutely no change in the FRMI scan. It was the same. And then, like, so when I got my hand on one of these scans that I'd seen in a magazine, I think it was the New Scientist, or it might have been that or Nature, but I got a picture, I got a colour comparison scan picture. And then I got a map of the brain, and different part, each part of your brain, has, the different partitions have different functioning, right? And so it seemed to me that the, the psychopathic brain was highly active at the back, in the lower brain stem, what we call the reptilian complex. They seem to be, and this is the language I was using at the time, deficient in the amygdala and the limbic regions, which are the gearbox of the brain. They would stop me from stealing your money for, some, for certain reasons. One, you might catch me and arrest me. It's, it stops you from having an, an animalistic impulse, you know, that kind of thing. It, it's, it makes you make decisions. And then finally, they were almost completely shut down in the frontal cortex of the brain, and this is really important. The prefrontal cortex of your brain is what makes you really human. You have a reptilian brain, a kind of a bird brain, and an animal brain. But in the front you have this prefrontal cortex. This is your human brain. It developed very suddenly and very quickly, about 65,000 years ago. It, ex it developed at the same time as art, language, cave art was first found, and we, they believe language came out. It was also seen to be related to things like synesthesia. Some people actually hear a sound and when they can think of a certain colour. You know, kind of that, that effect. So this was almost like our creative brain developed, but it was also our empathic brain. Inside the frontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, there's things called mirror neurons. Mirror neurons allow me to have an empathic understanding of you. <coughs> now, when I say empathic, I don't mean necessarily, you know, a bond, but like uh, an understanding that we all have to be work together. So it's like uh, if we were in a tribe doing things, our mirror neurons will fire in sync. Psychopaths don't even use their mirror neurons. They're off. And then I said, okay, that was just, okay. so, so it was a brain damage. I started to look into this. And the thing I found out was that it wasn't actually brain damage because all those bits were in there. They just weren't using them. They weren't shut off. They were literally using the brain they needed in life because all they cared about was, oh, the psychopaths were only concerned with two things, power and control. They don't care about anything else. And you can put everything in power control, politics, dominating someone sexually, financially, taking someone over, bullying someone at work, very common problems with psychopaths in everyday life, bullying, to destroying a country, to being the king of the world, to being an emperor. It's only power and control. And they have a brain, it's like a horses for courses situation. It only needs the parts of the brain to do this stuff, the lower brain regions. So, in 1947, Harvey, Harvey Kleckley and Bent came up with a book called The Mask of Sanity, and he was the first one to scientifically quantify what a psychopath was. And what he said a psychopath was, was a person who was a fully, a fully functioning, meaning a normal, what we'll see in normal life, you would think it was a normal person, who was a perfect mimic of another human being. For instance, they have no internal personality. They invent a persona. They're almost like an actor. And they invent a persona purposely to manipulate other people in situations. That's why it's perfect for a politician. Tell me what you want, vote for me, and I'll be it. Now, that ties into another thing. The personality construct is based on the belief that it's not actually real. All psychopaths will tell you, the ones I've interviewed, that they feel like there's nothing inside them. They're hollow. So they invent these, they, do, they don't have a sense of a soul. Well, you want to use that kind of crude language, but they don't feel that way. They feel empty. So they, they, what they do is they create these personalities, and this what creates the glibness. They're very, very full on, they can be at times. But they're also very devious, and this was makes them dangerous. Now, this brought up another issue. Like at the time, I believed, like most people then, that the human psyche or this consciousness, whatever you want to call it, was actually in the brain, and it was actually a function of uh, you know chemicals and 
electrical signals, synapses, neural partitions firing and so on. And then I, it, it was in an article I think I saw in another magazine and then I followed up, I seen a documentary with this guy on TV where they said that someone had asked the top neuroscience, where is consciousness in the brain? And Wilfield, well, uh, Wilder Penfield, who was the greatest neuroscientist of all time, agreed with the same thing, that we don't actually live inside our brains. We're not in here. We're not in here. What this thing is, is like a receiver broadcast observational response mechanism. Basically, your consciousness, your deepest identity, the psyche, what the, that's what the Greeks called the psyche, which is what you mean soul, uses this brain and nervous system and five senses to exist in this reality. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like it tunes into this reality, but it also creates it as well as it's been shown. There's an element of cause and effect here. And it's all going through the brain. Now you need your brain. You, you know, you see people say, oh, I get rid of my ego, and the, you know, we must transcend this body. Well, we have this for a reason, because we probably couldn't experience anything without whatever made, whatever created the nervous system and the brain to actually engage in this. Now, as I said, I was involved in music, I was involved in art, I used to write satirical political comedy, I used to do, I, used to, I was involved in lots of things, I did some amateur drama and stuff like that, and I wrote some poetry books. And I never met a truly created and gifted soul who was a psychopath. Now, I don't go around judging people and thinking about them that way, because the only ones I've ever met were, I've met five in my life. I met four of them, there were four of them on Wall Street bankers, one who admitted it, and another three who he pointed out to me who I had already suspected. And a woman I was in a relationship when I was in my very early 20s, that was a very horrific experience for me. And it turned out to be, it was a typical psychopathic relationship where they get into your mind, they play games with you, they play on your insecurities, your fears and anxiety, and they treat you pretty badly after making you fall very deeply in love with them. And because they're tremendous, ardent students of human behavior, they observe us like a botanist observes a flower. They're, they're, it's very, very, we're talking about a very devious and dangerous thing. Now, I'm not, I'm not looking for witch hunts or anything against these people. My attitude is just get away from them. Get on with your own life and take responsibility for your own actions of life. But, it, it's, it's, it's dark stuff and you know I wrote a couple of books called The Puzzling People with Apple of the Psychopath and another one called The Feet of Demons and another one called The Apple of the Psyche which took the whole issue from if you had a psychopath in your personal life that affected you or you were worried you might be in a relationship with one or you had a boss who was bullying you this might help you heal and that book did very very well for me it's probably one of the bigger selling titles in its field like anywhere and I get I constantly get letters from people saying you nailed it, that's exactly it. I've often been, I've been approached by top psychiatrists and neuroscientists who said, that's it, you did it. Uh, quite surprisingly, because I thought they were going to savage me, but they said it, it should have been something that was done in very simple, basic language, so everyone would know it, and it should not be trapped off in the world of academia, which it had been at that point. And they said, no, you did the, you did the right thing. And uh, so I was very happy with that, but it was also very difficult for me, because I used to get the most appalling letters about people being abused in the most horrific ways that was for times I've had to step back and say no more. And then you might get a letter from someone saying, my wife, my, me and my kids have got away from this guy who was abusive. He played mind games with us, he tortured the kids, a horrific bully, and then I'll make you feel better again, then you want to explore some more. And then, but also my attitude was, well, you know, as above, so below, or as, you know, as above, so below, or so above, as below, that the, the pathology we're seeing echoed in these individuals was exactly what the political system was. So I was very interested in what the issue was up there. In the first book, Puzzling People, I went, it was basically dealt with psychopathic behaviour in a very easy, understandable way that anyone from 15 to 90 could read the book. It could be translated to any language. And it could just be a toolkit and a guide. If people wanted to go deeper into these things, well, there was a whole world of like academia that could go into it. But that wasn't my job. I was giving out a toolkit. And so the second book, I did Defeat of Demons, took it to the next level. I started to look at it in terms of politics, control systems, and particularly bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is an actual psychopathic system. In terms of when something is, you look at the, the fa well, fascism is really not, fascism really isn't guys marching at goose step with boots. It's people in offices, you know, dotting the T, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's and doing the most appalling things. That's how you look at the history of the Soviet Union, Pol Pot's, you know, Khmer Rouge, Nazi Germany, 
IBM was, was hired to do the Holocaust computing. Bureaucracy is what fascism really is because it's cold, detached, away from humanity. And so we don't have a connection to other people. In that second book, I also realized that for some reason, since the time of Rome and maybe earlier, there was an absolute hatred of na native and indigenous and shamanic cultures. I won't say shamanic cultures, but native cultures, indigenous cultures. From AD 66, Suetonius Polonus launched a massive fleet across the Mena Straits in Wales to massacre the last of the Druids. This was at a time of a huge economic problem in Romano or Britain as well as social problems, and yet they went to all this trouble to get a handful of Druids. This is a reason for this, and I want to know the reason for this. This is the reason why the, the, the what you call the, the conquistadors and the Inquisition went to Peru, Mexico, South America. Now, you know, I've been reading lately about the Peruvian, the, in, the Peruvian invasion there, uh, Peru, by the Inquisition, and the most, most spooky things you could imagine. Again, it was bureaucracy. The Inquisition arrived in Peru, and at that time, you're talking about like five, six hundred years ago, going to Peru might have been like going to another a space planet. Completely different than anything in Europe. Within a couple of decades, they had vast records of everybody. Everybody in Peru, they had like all kind of, the, the Inquisition had built up on a massive bureaucracy. And this is how they actually really brought them down. They just, destroyed their, they just destroyed their ability to function as a people through bureaucracy in the same way the Romans were very good at that. The Romans, were fun, the Romans never invented anything. The Romans basically got everything off the Etruscans, the Phoenicians, and the Greeks, the Carthaginians, and a few others. But what the Romans were phenomenal at was taxes administration. You could walk into a Roman tax office 2,000 years ago and get tax records from you know, Colchester to Damascus, all individuals. And once they paid their taxes, they didn't care. So bureaucracy and coldness and, and, and this psychopathic thing seem to be very ingrained within all that. But there never seemed to be a place for the artist. In anyone like that, anyone who was natural, anyone who was not saying all oh, artists, I don't say artists are special, but they, well, maybe they are. But there was never a place for them in these kinds of totalitarian pathological societies, unless they were building statues of the emperor. You know, unless they were art that was actually celebrating the totalitarian pathology that was all that, that that gave them those jobs. So you did have like these totalitarian, or even not even in a democracy as well, pathological individuals harnessing artists in order to use it to celebrate their system. Very interesting stuff this is. Now, that's about as much as I'm going to talk about the psychopathic issue, but now, as I said, I never met anyone who was in the music business, I don't think, as a musician, maybe a few managers and things like that, promoters, but I don't think I ever met a really good guitar player, drummer, talented singer, songwriter, who had a pathological major. I never met a really talented artist that did. In fact, quite the opposite. The more, the more their, their beauty and their, their nature could be seen within the art. It could be seen there. It could also be seen within indigenous art that hadn't been touched by. There was a, an, an innocence and a purity there. And it was, hadn't been touched by what we call Western civilization. And I wanted to understand this, but I also wanted to understand this in terms of consciousness because there was another thing that bothered me too as well. A lot of the, the people I knew that were the most sort of like, they had like a, a very powerful artistic originality and create, creative drive about them, seemed to fall, you know, they weren't all like this, but there seemed to be higher rates of almost like a death wish. I had so many friends who like, you know, you know, they were like suicidal and became drug addicts who were very talented people. And then there was other ones who came, they just went, they just had difficulty existing in this world you know, very talented musicians, painters, artists, writers. And it's almost like the whole thing of evoking the jealousy of the gods. You know, the story of Prometheus who stole fire from the gods and gave it to the people. And Zeus, you know, found out, became jealous and had him pecked, you know, his liver pecked out on the side of a mountain for all eternity. The idea that we wanted to take something that belonged to the gods and give it to the people. You know, George Bernard Shaw, when he used to see a brilliant musician or poet or actor who used to write letters telling them to give a bad performance or you'd be dead before you're 27. Because that seemed to be the thing. You were really talented, you were doomed to die, evoking the jealousy of the gods. You know, how many people that Simon Cowell 
Productive oh, like wonderful. <laughs> Die young, but we've lost Jimi Hendrix, you know, Kurt Cobain, Sylvia Platt. I mean, the list is phenomenal. It's terrifying, actually. See, the greatest artists are all either suicidal or they're, uh, they have a death wish or they have problems. They break down. But yet, yeah, there's something also tremendously beautiful in when they fall apart. They seem to produce their best art. And this I find amazing. I mean, it's almost like that became along with the study of consciousness. Well, so what is consciousness, right? Is it Why do people create art? And I've come to the conclusion, you know, you know, a long time now, again, that your consciousness is not in your body. It's just not. You know, it's not in your brain. This is just the machine that operates it. And just like you'd use a paintbrush to paint a picture, your body is just part of that process. This is why the Amish in Pennsylvania, they don't use tools that don't that aren't an extension of the human arm. So a screwdriver is an extension of like twisting with your fingers. A hammer would be an extension of your fist banging, and so on. That's why they don't use, they wouldn't have anything that would, that would not be like an, an, an extension of your body. Very interesting idea. And they're phenomenal craftspeople. And so, you know, that, so this is a tool we're using, okay? So then I want, I, I look very deeply into psychology and psychiatry, and you know, specifically through the work of Carl Jung, this idea became very apparent to me that there were two poles of cognitive functioning, right? There's two poles. The polarity would be your consciousness, what I'm talking to you right here now, and the subconscious, what's going on inside, okay? And as I came more to understand the psychopathic issue, I realized that all the propaganda and all the sort of things were bombarded with, and all the reasons we went to war, it didn't aim at the consciousness, it aimed at the subconsciousness. They went straight to the core of our type of personality. A great example of that would be Ed, Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He was the man who took all his uncle's work and understanding of anxieties, deep rooted fears within the subconscious now. Took him to America. And he was 20, he's a young lad, 24 years old, and he immediately got a job with the Woodrow Wilson presidency and the globalists within the American establishment to get the United States into World War I. So he, what they wanted to do, Americans didn't want to go into World War I, they were isolationist. He was the one who came up with the poster of the German soldier with almost like a gorilla face, you know, like a demon holding a rifle with a baby on the end of the bayonet. And that got, it was painting. And that, he didn't have to say it was true. He said, he told the propaganda the people in the White House, you don't, have to, you don't have to report this story. You don't have to say it's true. You don't have to give evidence. You just have to give the people this image and they will support the war effort against Germany. Bang, the Americans were in the war. <laughs> Worked like an absolute treat. The Americans were so impressed with this that all the corporations descended upon him the most famous one of all was Philip Morris. Philip Morris went to the Bernays and said, how do we get women to smoke? We've only got 50% of the market. How do we get women to smoke cigarettes? So what he did was he got, a, he looked at what was happening with women's movement in America and he found that the suffragettes were looking for women to get the vote. So there was a big move towards equality at the beginning of the women's lib thing. Women didn't even have to vote in the United States at this time. And so he paid a bunch of Manhattan socialites during a suffragette parade to, in the, you know, it was considered, the time it was considered highly scandalous for women to smoke in public. Highly scandalous. He said to them, on my cue, when they got in front of City Hall and all the press, I want you to take out a cigarette, every one of you, call it a, a torch of freedom, light it and then smoke it. And then say, this is, this is our stance against men. And of course, it worked. And then next thing you know, Philip Morris's profits doubled. And you know, because of these horrible cigarettes that they're made and with all this crap inside them, that's not like real tobacco, millions of women have died of cancer. And that's how they, because he played on irrational fears, with what? Fears of men and women curling them against each other. And so that I started to really learn about the idea of this kind of thing of two poles of cognitive functioning. Who, who am I really? Who are you really? What has the ego got to do with it? How much of our lives are driven by this? And what does have to do with creativity and art? And why are artists driven by certain things? And why are these people who are so gifted and so artistic 
you know, have so many problems, and the more talented they are, the more they're more likely to be hit by these terrible things. There was a, there was a in James Joyce in his uh, his book Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, he had this 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 line that goes, "Welcome, O life, I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality." Of of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my youth. I think that's one of the most amazingly powerful like paragraphs ever written. In the smithy of my soul I form the uncreated conscience of my youth. But inside my psyche or inside me I'm actually creating a new reality for the future generations going forward. That's the purpose of art. Carl Jung knew it and everyone else knew it. And that was why the jealousy of the gods was both. Their artists have the ability to alter reality going forward, first in a cognitive sense, but also what makes an artist so powerful is they can do it in a subconscious sense. You look at the movies of Stanley Kubrick, they are absolutely, you know, you watch a film like 2001 A Space Odyssey, it seems like a very strange sci-fi film, it's somewhat entertaining, it's a bit odd. And then people watch it and say, oh, it sounds pretty neat, there's some great special effects in it. What was the monkey about? You know, what's the monkeys fighting about? What was this about? What did Hal, the, the robot, represent? And what's, what Kubrick was doing was a brilliant man. He was aiming for the subconscious archetypal person, the core of the personality of the viewer. So people went to see that film, and even like, I can remember my old man saying, oh, I, I saw that film years ago, what did you think of it? Uh, I, I thought it was shite, that's what he said about it. <laughs> and, then, and then they go, well, you like the, he said, didn't like it. And he says, no, I'll go and see it again. <laughs> you understand? It had, it, the, the movie had, on the surface, because it wasn't spaceships fighting in space and while shoot with ray guns, it was a crapshit sci-fi film, right? But there was something about it, and millions of people all over the world were like, I have to see that again. I have to see that, I guess. There's something going on there. There's something in there. And the, the, the film can be read on so many levels. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a look at alchemy. It's a look at, you know, all kinds of things. He was, some people claim he was, he was blowing open the fact that the, the, the NASA space missions weren't real. Get it the hard stuff for now. But there was one thing that's absolutely certain about that film. The main human in the, the film, there's a character called Dave. He's a, an astronaut and he's the first one who wakes up along with a guy called Frank. And all the other astronauts are, put, are still in the like, cryogenic state. And Hal, who's the robot, he's like the all-seeing eye all over the ship. He runs the ship and spots everything. Takes the note, takes, has a, has a, actually has a plan to destroy and kill everyone on the ship. But he thinks it's going fine until he sees Dave doing sketches with a sketchbook. And Hal knows then that the artist is the most dangerous person on the spaceship because he's the one less more than likely to figure out what Hal is up to. Because he's not obsessed with numbers, statistics. He's not obsessed with following plans, rules, formula. What Dave is doing is he's like doing his spare time doing sketches and he and Hal, the robot says, can you hold the drawing up? And he shows it. And he goes, you're getting really good, Dave. Hal's actually a psychopath, by the way. It's an allegory of a psychopath. <laughs>